Hi, good morning. Well, good afternoon now. So uh, my name is JC Lopez, and I work with the Global Storage Consulting Practice within Red Hat. And um, what is particular in our group is that we not only do consulting, but we also do training. So I'm actually training uh, Ceph-related classes for Red Hat, and I travel, you know, every single place, and just like go and teach about Ceph. Um, specifically Red Hat Ceph storage, but more in general, everything that is related to Ceph. And it just happened that I was asked to run this event today while you're having some good food, I hope. <laughs> and uh, if you see me starving and just like rolling myself on the ground, it's probably because I'm hungry, okay? <laughs> so um, the idea of this presentation is to focus on, uh, on highlighting how we can make um, OpenStack integrated with Ceph, so that we can use Ceph in an OpenStack environment. And you will see how easy it is, and given what you can do with Ceph and the flexibility of Ceph that we'll review, and all the different access methods that we have with Ceph, why it definitely makes Ceph really the best fit when it comes down to storage for your OpenStack environment. So in order to get started, we'll just like review a, a couple, just like two slides about um, storage concepts that we'll we'll be using today, we'll be discussing uh, during this session. Uh, first of all is the different type of storage we have uh, in IT environments. So we do have block storage. So block storage has been around, uh, as you can see my gray here, right? I started uh, in IT quite some time ago. I actually started working on mainframes. And at that time we already had block storage. So the idea is that you show a device to your server or, I mean, system, and you use that device so that you can use it accessing the different blocks on that particular device. So most of you do know that on a block device, what we call a disk drive, actually we have sectors. So what we do when we say block device is that, yes, indeed, we access blocks, but the blocks we access are actually the sectors on the disk drive. So to explain you and to tell you how common block storage is, is very simple. I see a lot of laptops, you know, here and there in the room, and you all know that your laptop actually boots from a block device. And on top of that block device, what do we put? We put what we have here, which is the second type of access method we have, which is a file system. So file system is another way where you can actually access the storage but instead of referencing a particular sector on the device itself, you reference either a directory or a file, and you access the file, and you read and you write, you open the file, you close the file, and you do whatever you want, creating directories, removing directories, and creating files. So those two types of storage have been around for quite some time. Um, basically, as far as I can remember, when I started over 30 years ago, that's exactly what we were doing 30 years ago. Now, the last player we have over there, which is uh, blocks, uh, object storage, is actually a type of storage that appeared later. So the concept was known um, and became known actually when object-oriented programming came into the IT industry, because um, object-oriented programming offered one particular functionality that was called serialization. And it was the ability for an object that you were creating in your program to self save itself and to self reload itself. So the idea of object storage was to port this feature and to make it available as a global storage. So when you access object storage, rather than referencing a directory name or a file name, what do you do? You reference the idea of an object that you want to either load or that you want to write. And that's the three different types of storage we have in IT storage today. And tomorrow, we'll probably have some more, OK? Because we keep reinventing ourselves and making things better. Now, the second uh, concept slide that I show you here is the different type of protection that we can offer in software-defined storage. So most of you, if you're familiar with storage, you've all heard about RAID technologies, OK? RAID 0, RAID 1, RAID 5, RAID 6, OK? So the two ways that we have to protect data within Ceph is either to do what we call replicated storage, which is basically to protect the data. We're going to make full copies of every single byte of data that you store in your Ceph storage cluster. 
So the advantage of replicated protection is that it provides a very high durability because you can actually select the number of copies you want to protect the data so that you can select a number that is high enough so that you can survive a single failure and even a, do a double failure. Advantage of replicated is that it provides you with a very quick recovery because you have full copies of the object. The only thing you need if something fails is to reuse one of the existing surviving copies to recreate a new copy and you're back in business. Advantage of replicated is that it's performance optimized. The object exists as a whole, is not just like chunked, is not encoded, nothing happens to it. That's the best performance you can get is through replicated storage. Now the other type of protection we have here is the actual erasure coding. Erasure coding is a way so that you can protect the data, but it's gonna be capacity optimized. So we're gonna do exactly what we do with RAID. So we're gonna store the data and we're going to calculate some parity so that if something comes missing, we will be able to rebuild the missing data using the surviving data, including the parities that we calculated. So it's really an equivalent to what we are doing with RAID 5 and RAID 6. Now let's have a look at Ceph's um, and Red Hat Ceph storage specifically and the way it's actually architecture. So that's a very nice diagram that has different layers. So we have at the top what we call the access methods and we'll explain the different ones we have. We have an API called, known as Libretos that we'll discover. But the most interesting part that we're gonna start from is the actual bottom layer, which is Rados. Rados is the actual uh, storage backend for the Ceph cluster and where we're gonna be storing every single byte of data that we wanna store uh, in our Ceph cluster. So the access method, we have one known as RGW and we'll see that we can serve uh, A3 and Swift requests from the Rados gateway. We have RBD so that we can provide block devices on top of our Ceph cluster. And we have CephFS, which is a distributed file system POSIX compliant. So as you can see, and just because I wanna start with that, and there's one limitation that's a little asterisk that we have here at the top, that with, although within the Ceph community, CephFS is available, the code is in place, so you can use it. When uh, you use Red Hat Ceph storage, which is the downstream project based on Ceph from Red Hat, we consider CephFS as a technology preview in Red Hat Safe Storage version 2.0, and later in the near future, it will become production ready. So, so far, we recommend and we encourage our customers to use CephFS so that we can collect data about potential bugs that still remain in the product, but we do not support CephFS in a production environment for our customers that use Red Hat Safe Storage. So the reliable autonomous distributed object store is an object store. So what is actually surprising is that on top of an object store, we're gonna do object storage if we want. So the idea is that this is the core backend of Ceph and every single uh, uh, byte that we're gonna store in Ceph will be stored as an object into this object store. And the idea is that we're gonna find and we're going to show you how we actually distribute the data in this object store so that we can leverage the capacity that we have with all of the disk drives that we're gonna have in our Ceph cluster. So it's a software-based component. So Ceph is software-defined storage. So uh, it's available you know, from, uh, as far as Red Hat Ceph storage is concerned, we support customers using Ubuntu platforms and Red Hat platforms, so on rail platforms. And if you are using Ceph, the community bits, well, you have even more ports. Uh, it's available from uh, for different distros, so you can actually run Ceph not only on RHEL, not only on Ubuntu, but also on other platforms. Now when it comes down to Redos, this object store, so the idea of the object store is that we're gonna aggregate a collection of disk volumes that we have in our environment. So we're gonna have these little squares here and that's uh, going to represent what we call object storage devices that will cover, cover apt after and every single object storage device is actually using a disk drive. And on this particular disk drive, depending on what happens and how we place the data, we will be storing the data when we have a write, but when we wanna do a read I.O. operation, we will potentially come back to 
any of those disk drives, object storage devices, so that we can actually read the data and serve the I.O. request to the client. So that's what we have in the back. And as you can see, uh, so we just have like basically two lines. Uh, we'll explain about the circles in a very uh, short moment. So basically, what do you, um, what do, you do? Ceph is a, typically a scale-out model. So when you want to grow, because you want more capacity, you add more disk drives. But you can also scale out if you need more performance. So depending on what you are trying to achieve, you can even blend the type of disk drives that you can actually integrate inside your Ceph cluster. So you can have a mix, some data being stored on set of drives, other data being stored on SAS drives, and other data being stored on SSD or PCIe and VRAMs. You can actually choose whatever you want, and we will see that we can actually partition our cluster so that we can select what type of data goes on one type of storage. So the object storage devices, uh, also known as the object storage demons, are, is the piece of software that is, actually the, uh, that is actually the intelligent part within the Ceph cluster. So everyone you know, says, why intelligent? Because they are the one that actually serve the I.O. request. So we'll see that we have a second type of daemon, daemon that is just here to actually capture the current state of the cluster. So the workhorses of a Ceph cluster are the OSDs. So in OSD so far, um, you can scale as many as you want. So um, the bare minimum, if you want to build a Ceph cluster, if it's just to play because you want to just like see how it works, you can actually build, and I, you know, I've done so many times just for, just for the fun, you can actually build a Ceph cluster just for playing, not for production, obviously, with a single disk drive. You can actually do that. Now in a production environment, the bare minimum you're going to need, by default, we create three copies of each object to protect the data. So basically, the minimum number of disk drives that you need for a Ceph cluster is actually three. Now you can actually scale, and you can mix the type of drives you want, and you can go up into the thousands of disk drives that you're going to aggregate inside your Ceph cluster. Now the monitors are the famous circle that we saw in the Rados picture into the uh, uh, diagram. So the monitors are here so that they can actually maintain cluster membership and maintain the map that will contain the list of all the elements present in the cluster and their actual status. So the monitors will maintain different maps. So there's a map for the monitors, there's a map for the OSDs, there's a map for the MDSs, and every single element that we have in those maps carry uh, the characteristics, including the status, of every single component. So for every single OSD running in the cluster, it will say this particular OSD is up, this particular OSD is down. And we'll have that in the map so that at any point in time, you know, we know exactly who's running, who's not running, who's taking part in the cluster to have data, and who's not taking part in the cluster to actually have data. So how many do we need? The bare minimum for a production cluster is three. Why? Because of the way we configure the monitors so that we can validate every single map update in the cluster. So in order for an event to be validated and an update to be applied to the maps, we need a majority of the monitors to validate the event. So if one daemon stops, OSD stops, we need at least two monitors, more than 50% of the of demands, to actually validate the event. And that's why we want another number so that we don't end up okay, with a split brain scenario. So if we had two, yes indeed, we would have no single point of failure, but because of the way we have configured the algorithm, two, one stops, yeah, one's still running, but one out of two is 50% exactly, and that's not more than 50%. And that's why we need a minimum of three in a production cluster. Now usually what we say and what uh, some of the customers most of the time ask when they start and they deploy the cluster, say, can we deploy more months than just three? So yes, you can. Every single component is safe, is scalable. So just as the number of OSDs is scalable, uh, the actual number of months is actually scalable. What we usually recommend is that if you know that your cluster is going to grow to a very large number, above 300 or 400 disk drives, we highly recommend to deploy at least five months 
okay? If your cluster will have no more than 300 OSDs, three is just like good enough. There's no problem. And the way we dispatch the months is that we dispatch the months, we deploy the months on the failure domains that you're gonna be running in your cluster. So if your failure domain to host every single copy of an object is in a different rack, we recommend that you deploy one monitor per rack. If you just have servers because you don't have racks, we recommend that you just deploy the monitors on different servers only. So where does an object live in this object store? So we have Rados at the bottom. So we have the application at the top. So the whole idea, we said that the OSDs are serving the IO request. So fair enough, but where do we put this data? So we need to find a way so that we can actually balance and use the entire data space available in our self cluster. Remember, we can scale and up to more than a thousand disk drive in the cluster. So we want to make sure that we make good usage of all this space and we try to dispatch the data so that we can have good performance by dispatching the IO request to the different div, uh, disk devices, but also use the entire space that is available on all those disk drives. So the way it works is that in a self cluster, you have what we call pools, and those pools are logical partitions inside your self cluster. That's what you're gonna use so that you can actually grant uh, permissions to the users trying to access the data in the cluster, but also, we're going to be able to assign to each pool a type of protection and a placement strategy. So we will see that we have one algorithm that drives the placement of the data in the cluster, and this algorithm is known as CRUSH, C-R-U-S-H, and we'll explain what the, the, the acronym means, okay? And you're gonna be able to assign to every single pool one and only one placement strategy. So you can say this logical partition will have its data on set of drives, this particular partition will have its data on SSDs, and so on. So every time you access uh, data in the cluster, so you will be referencing one object, and that object will be in one partition, so in one pool. And that's how you access the data. So you always reference one particular object in one particular pool. And based on the protection, we will go and look at the data on a particular type of OSD that uses that particular type of drive, and we will also check before we access the data that the particular user that is requesting access to the object does have permission to actually access this particular pool. Now the object is one thing, but how can we just like get a better dispatch of all the objects inside the cluster? And in order to do that, we have CRUSH. And CRUSH stands for Controlled Replication and the Scalable Hashing. That's the name. So every single pool we have in a cluster is going to be divided into sections. And every single section will be known as a placement group. So when you're going to be storing an object or reading an object from the pool, we're going to determine to which placement group this particular object comes from. So an object can belong to one and only one placement group. And you can configure the number of placement groups that you want for a particular pool. So the more placement groups you will have, the more you will disperse the sections across the object storage demons. The lesser the number of placement groups, the less you will dispatch the objects amongst your object storage devices. The example I always give is that imagine that you have a self cluster with 300 OSDs, so 300 disk drives. You create one pool and only one pool in your cluster, and you say, I want to create that pool with one and only one placement group. What would happen? Because an object must belong to one and only one placement group, all of the objects would belong to that single placement group. And a placement group lives on an OSD which means that in that particular case, it would be very, very unwise to do so because even though you have a thousand OSDs, because you have a single PG in your entire cluster, you would be using a single disk drive, okay? So the idea is that we have the placement groups so that we can assign and distribute the placement groups on all the OSDs so that we can split the load and the space on all the disk drives that we have in the cluster. 
So crush is a quick calculation. So to determine to which placement group an object belongs, we actually make a modulo operation. We take the name of the object and we make a modulo operation against the number of placement groups we have in the pool. So modulo operations will give us one and only one result out of the many PGs that we have in the pool. So we will be able to determine which one and only one placement group in that pool will actually host this particular object. In the second time and the second run, what will happen is that we will have to find where this particular placement group is actually hosted. So first we do the modulo operation on the object name, and then we will call a special function known as the crush function, and that crush function will tell us this particular placement group is on this particular OSD. And then the application will go and talk to that particular OSD to either write an object or read an object. This way, we'll distribute the load across all the OSDs, and we will consume the space on every single object storage device in the cluster. So CRUSH uh, is known as a pseudo-random placement algorithm. Uh, pseudo-random, why? Because we have a randomized portion, which is the modulo operation, and the dispatch of the placement groups on top of the OSDs. But what is interesting with CRUSH is that the placement of the placement groups on the OSDs is linked to the actual state of the cluster. So for one particular given cluster state, imagine that you have a cluster with the southern OSDs, they're all running, okay? You stop one OSD, that's gonna change the state of the cluster because one OSD stopped. What are we gonna do? We're gonna reassign some of the PGs that were on that OSD that you just stopped to other OSDs in the cluster. Now imagine that an hour later, you actually restart this particular OSD. What is the state of the cluster after the restart of the OSD? The exact same one as before you stopped it. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna pull the PG back exactly where it was on the original OSD. So that's why we say pseudo-random, because there's a randomized portion, but the placement of the PGs is the same for a given cluster state, and it always worked the same. So um, fast calculation, the calculation is performed on the client side, not on the OSD side. So the client, using his own CPU and his own RAM and his own local resources, will make the calculation for the modulo operation and will call the crush function to actually find the placement of that particular PG on the OSDs. So a crush was designed to provide a statistically uniform distribution. So a lot of people get puzzled when they start deploying the Ceph cluster because they see an uneven space usage across the OSDs. Why? Because crush was never designed so far uh, to provide an even distribution, which is you know, different. Now there is big work uh, in the Ceph community uh, through Red Hat, but also everyone participating to the community so that we can make Crush better to get a more even distribution of the data in the cluster. And it's a work that is actually taking place, is getting refined every, with every single version of Crush so that we always try to make it better so that we have a better and a more even distribution of the data when it comes down to space. So the mapping is stable. Remember what we said, uh, the mapping of the placement groups is always the same for a given cluster state. So when you stop and start OSDs, whatever you want, whatever you do, as long as you don't change the number of placement group, the mapping of the placement group will always be the same. So you can alter crush and you can modify the crush configuration on the fly. So uh, crush is infrastructure aware. So the idea is that we are going to be able to say, I want, for example, to place every single copy of the data in a different rack, on a different server, in a different row, in a different IT room. So you can actually choose the way you want to configure Crush so that you can select where the data goes and where each copy of the object actually goes inside your Ceph cluster. So you can adjust every single parameter within uh, Crush so the number of copies you want, 
the minimum number of copies that must be available so that we can serve out your request. And you can influence the placement of the placement groups by adjusting what we call the crush weight. So every single element in the crush definitions will have a weight. The higher the weight, the more placement groups we will give to one particular element. The lesser the weight, the lesser the number of PGs we will give to someone to manage. So ultimately, and that's a test that every single person that deploys Ceph in the beginning tries, what happens if you set the weight to zero for a particular element? Well, Crush will remove all of the placement groups that were given to protect to that particular object storage device. And as soon as you increase the weight again, greater than zero, then Crush starts assigning placement group to that particular object storage device. Now, Crush belongs to Rados, to the object store. That's the placement strategy, the placement algorithm we use. And the first thing that comes on top of this object store is a native API. So this native API is known as Librados. So we have different wrappers around Librados so that you can actually insert calls directly into your application so that you can actually store and retrieve data outside uh, to or from a Rados cluster. So we do have some customers at Red Hat that use that particular feature and they embed the calls to Librados directly into their own application so that they don't deploy any of those fancy access methods on the top, the Rados gateway to do A3, or block devices, or CFFS. They make the calls directly from their application. Now, when you have an application using Librados inside your application, you make a call, so you have to open a connection to the Ceph cluster you have to open what we call a Ceph context, which is tell the cluster, tell the API, with what logical partition you're gonna work, the pool name A, the pool name B, the pool name C, and then you can make your call so that you can do get requests to obtain an object, retrieve an object from the cluster, or you can do a put request so that you can actually write something into the cluster. And from your uh, server where the application is running, uh, through the Librados library, shared library, we will go and access the cluster so that we can do whatever the application has requested. So this is a native protocol. Has nothing to do with um, a three and Swift protocols. It's what we call the native Ceph protocol. So Ceph, by the way, when we come down to protocols, is entirely TCP based. We have zero UDP in, a Ceph, in the Ceph software. So everything is using TCP. Now the access method, what we call the uh, higher level access method, the first one that is available out of a Ceph cluster is the Rados gateway. So the Rados gateway is a piece of software that we deploy on top of the Ceph cluster. So the Rados gateway is actually a client of the Ceph cluster. So your application that uses F3 or uses Swift will make the regular Swift calls and regular F3 calls, uh, F3 and Swift are RESTful protocols, they will arrive over the network to the Rados gateway and the Rados gateway will interpret that request to do whatever it needs to do and will store and retrieve the data out of the Ceph cluster. So the way you deploy the gateway is on top of the cluster. The Rados gateway is not part of the cluster. It's exactly what your application, in the first case where we explain an application using Librados, that's the exact same case. The Rados gateway is an application that runs and uses the Ceph cluster to store and retrieve data uh, in, uh, to and from the Ceph cluster. So remember we said um, there is, um, Ceph is a scale-out model so the Rados gateway also falls into that scale-out model. There is no limit on the number of Rados gateways you can deploy. So you deploy as many gateways as you want. So either for performance reasons, because you need more performance, so more and more requests are gonna come in, you know, through F3 or Swift. So you wanna be able to handle those requests. Advantage of the F3 and Swift protocol, they're RESTful protocols, so you can actually put your gateways 
behind HTTP load balancers because uh, Thrin Swift use HT the HTTP protocol to actually communicate. And you can also deploy multiple gateways because you want to be able to store different data in different pools. So you can actually deploy a set of gateways that store data on a particular pool or store and deploy another set of gateways that store data in another pool. What is cool with the gateway is that you can, when you become you know, good enough and just like you are used enough to uh, the configuration of the Rados gateway, you can actually have a single set of Rados gateway store data in different type of pools. So some, uh, we, we use what we call placement strategies uh, inside um, the Rados gateways. And you can actually have a single gateway store data in one pool that uses SATA and store data in another pool that uses SSDs. So this makes uh, the gateway highly scalable. So a lot of people say how scalable it is when it comes down to performance. Well, we have numerous cases that we've been um, running with some of our customers where we help them to design their infrastructure and we were able to achieve way, way over two gigabytes per second using the Rados gateway and the S3 protocol. So that gives you an idea of the kind of bandwidth that you can generate. And that particular case that I'm thinking of was only with four Rados gateways. Four Rados gateways on a cluster, just like over you know, two gigabytes per second. Now the second access method we have is RBD. So RBD is the ability we have so that we can create on top of the Ceph cluster block devices. So remember the gateway, S3 and Swift. So Swift talks to you when you're OpenStack already. And RBD, block devices, uh, you just like basically see where we're going. We're going on to the way so that we can actually support something like Cinder uh, with the block devices. So the uh, idea of the block devices is that you can create as many block devices as you want in your Ceph cluster. Advantage of the RBD feature, every single block device can have its own characteristics. Why? Because a block device first lives in a pool. So remember that a pool can use different type of devices. So you can have block devices that will be using fast devices and other block devices that will use capacitive block devices, such as set of drives, eight terabytes or 10 terabytes. The second uh, thing we have is that uh, we can also, remember everything is stored as an object in Ceph, we can actually for each RBD select the size of the object we want to create in the Rados object store. Why do we want to be able to do that? For performance reasons also. Because the bigger the objects we have, that's very well suited for bandwidth intensive applications. But when you have IO intensive applications, so smaller IO requests, then you want to be able to adjust the size of each object so that you can actually dispatch more IO requests, small IO requests to more different disk devices. So in a virtual environment, we'll have the VM. The, VL, the VM will be uh, shown a particular block device. And through the hypervisor, we'll just like go and access through LibRBD, which is uh, LibRBD is the library that we use to access a block device in a virtual environment. And the, the RBD, the particular block device we have being accessed from the VMs, will be broken down into multiple objects so that depending on the sector or the block you access on the device, we'll go and talk to this particular device, or this one, or this one, or this one, or this one. This way when the VM just like throws all of the IO requests, we dispatch the IO request because every single object, remember, is assigned to one PG and the PG is assigned to an OSD. So this will distribute the IO load across all the block device, all the disk devices we have in our Ceph cluster. Now the advantage of using RBD um, in a virtual environment is that you can actually decouple completely the compute power from the storage. So on your Nova compute nodes in the OpenStack you know, environment, you need nothing. The only thing you need as a storage on the compute node is the ability to boot your compute node, which is basically a boot device. All of the storage from 
uh, used by the VMs will actually be in the Ceph cluster. And all of them will be doing the same thing. The VM will be shown a device. The VM will access the device and through the hypervisor, we'll go and talk to some OSDs out there in our Ceph cluster. Another cool feature we have is a kernel module. So you can actually use on any regular server that does have this module available, and that's the case of RHEL, but also plenty of other uh, different distributions. Uh, we have the ability to access a block device directly from the operating system. So using the RBD command, you will be able to show and create a local device in slash dev so that on that particular server, you can actually do whatever you want with the device. What you will typically do is that you will format the device so that you create a file system on top of it so that you can actually use the regular you know, CD commands and whatever commands that you want to use on your operating system so that you can access the file system that is sitting on top of an RBD device that is actually in the Ceph cluster. So on your Linux host, through uh, a module that we call KRBD, so we call it KRBD just to make the difference between RBD being the name of the feature and KRBD being the RBD kernel module inside the Linux distro. Now the last access method we have, CephFS, is the ability to create a uh, distributed file system, shared file system, POSIX compliant, so that you can actually have multiple users talking to a single file system. So typically, uh, kind of what you would do in a NAS environment, for those of you who are familiar with the storage acronyms, RBD would typically be uh, in the SAN space, while CephFS will typically be in the NAS space. So CephFS um, is just like two things. Uh, it's a POSIX file system. So when you use a POSIX file system, you use inodes. So when you access the data that is actually stored in the file system, you access inodes. The problem of Ceph is that, remember, we have an object store in the back end. So an object store knows about objects. So the file system that we want to use, expose, uses inodes. But what we store in Rados are inodes. So we're going to need to have a way so that we can actually do the mapping between the inodes and the actual objects we have in the Ceph cluster, but also to store the ACLs and various information when the clients actually access the CephFS file system. That's going to be the job of a particular daemon, and that particular daemon is going to handle all of this metadata to do the mapping and store the ACLs. So this particular daemon will, know, will be known as the metadata server. And for the data, which is the actual content of the inodes, those will be stored in objects inside the OSDs uh, in the Ceph cluster. So to access the CephFS file system, we have one kernel module. So just like we have KRBD, we have one kernel module uh, that is available. Uh, so remember, as tech preview, uh, for Red Hat Safe Storage 2.0 uh, on RHEL, but is also available on other distros, such as Ubuntu, for example, uh, to just name one. So that's for the coverage of the functional part of Ceph. And if we need to do a mapping of where will it fit with OpenStack and what it is a good fit with OpenStack, uh, that's all in one slide. So we have the Rados gateway uh, that will be able to be integrated with Keystone so that we use the user definitions that are in Keystone to grant access to a particular data. The Rados gateway does support Swift and A3, so all of the Swift requests or A3 requests in your OpenStack environment will be handled by the Rados gateway. And remember the Rados gateway using Librados actually stores and retrieves data out of the uh, Ceph cluster we have. Now for RBD, we do have the ability to integrate Cinder with uh, our, the RBD feature so that every single block device you create within Cinder will be using the RBD feature uh, inside Ceph. We also have the ability to integrate Glance with RBD so that every single Glance image will be stored on a Ceph RBD. And we also have the support of RBD for Nova ephemeral storage. 
So for Nova ephemeral storage, when you boot your VMs and we just like download the boot image and we just like put that into ephemeral storage, we'll be able to use RBDs in order to do that. Now the last part that is completely on the right, uh, that's Manila. Uh, remember, CephFS is tech preview only. So the idea is that when CephFS uh, is going to be tagged as production ready for Red Hat Ceph storage, then it will become a very good solution for Manila so that you can actually configure the Manila shares uh, that you want to assign to your VMs and that can be accessed through your VMs in your OpenStack environment. Now, the ability to actually use Ceph in every single part of your OpenStack you know, deployment makes it really a very simple solution because it can actually fit all the spaces and all the spots for whatever uh, place you want to use. And that's why Ceph is a very popular choice in OpenStack deployments. So quick question, who is using Ceph in this deployment? Only? I thought it would be more than that. Who uses NetApp? Who uses LVM? Three, four, five. Oh, okay. Now let's have a look now on how we can do it. And just to show you um, how easy it is and the few commands that are needed and the few parameters that are needed so that you can actually perform the integration uh, of the pieces together. So remember we said glance uh, images. So I just put in one slide just to show you uh, basically how short it is. So just as a reminder, um, Ceph and, and OpenStack have been just like very close to each other and uh, Ceph became very popular in the OpenStack community very early uh, in the cycles. The, the version, uh, the OpenStack version that really brought a lot of stability and ease of deployment when it comes down to the integration between Ceph and OpenStack is actually Grizzly. So Grizzly was the first version where things became really easy and pretty stable. That's when it all started and then it just got refined more and more to gain in maturity and uh, even uh, better deployment. So the first thing that we want to do when we want to perform an integration so that Glance uses uh, Ceph RBDs for storing the Glance images is that we're going to create a separate partition inside a Ceph cluster so that in this particular partition, remember we call the partition pools, we only have Glance boot images. So that uh, partition can be created by one and only one command in the Ceph cluster. It's the Ceph command, OSDE pool create. You specify the name of the pool, the name of the logical partition you want to create, and you specify the number of placement groups you want in that particular partition. Now you see that I used two power of X because it's a best practice in Ceph so that we get a better distribution of the placement groups amongst the OSDs. Is to use a power of two for the number of placement groups that you want in each logical partition. Then you will use the Ceph auth get or create command so that you create one user so that particular user can actually access this pool so that we can upload the glance images into the pool but we can also retrieve the glance images from that particular pool. So we specify at the end the dash O option so that uh, the path to a file that we call in Ceph environment the keyring file. So in a Ceph cluster to handle the permissions we create users and each user is assigned a secret key. And the keyring file will be a special file that contains the name of the user and the actual secret key for that user. So if you want to be able to access the Ceph cluster from the Glance node, you will, be a, you will have to make a copy of that keyring file and copy it onto your Glance node so that your Glance node can actually access the Ceph cluster. So we will copy the uh, keyring file with an FCP operation onto the Glance node and we will also make a copy of the Ceph configuration file that is by default in slash etc slash Ceph uh, directory on any of the Ceph nodes. And in that particular copy that we will push over to the Glance node, we'll just add two lines. 
square bracket, the name of the user that you created for glance, and keyring equal the path to the location where you actually copied the keyring file. Now just make sure that this keyring file that you copied over to the glance node has permission so that the glance daemons can actually access the file. If you cannot, basically the connection to the Ceph cluster will fail because without being able to access the keyring file, the uh, client cannot connect to the Ceph cluster. Now on the glance side, so this takes care of the Ceph side, on the glance side, we have the glance store section. So we will list in the uh, stores available, RBD as one of the stores available. Default store, if we always want to use RBD as the default store, we can change the default store to RBD. Show image direct URL equal true. And this is for a particular reason, is that in order to um, make good use of Ceph, we use, when we boot the VMs, the, the clone feature that is available on the RBDs. And for the clone feature to, can be, to be able to be used on the Nova Compute nodes, we need this particular parameter to be set so that we can create a clone of the boot image, of the glance image directly from the Nova node so that we can actually boot quicker the actual VM. RBD store user will be the username that we have created up here. Uh, RBD store pool, the name of the pool that we have created up here. RBD store Ceph comp, the path to the Ceph uh, comp file. So by default slash sc slash Ceph slash Ceph dot comp, but you can put it anywhere. RBD store chunk size, which is the size of each object for every single block device we want to create in the Rados object store. By default, if you do not specify this value, the value will be eight. So every single object that we create for every single block device that will contain a glance image will be eight megabytes. If you want to reuse smaller objects, the values can only be power of twos. So four, eight, 16, and the maximum value is 32. We cannot use objects bigger, bigger than 32 megabytes for an RBD device. And flavor equal keystone, because by default, the flavor parameter contains uh, when you deploy OpenStack out of the box, if you don't say anything, uh, Glance will be configured for LVM. And this parameter will be set to Keystone plus Cache Management so that we can speed up the access to uh, the Glance images, but because we use RBDs, we do not use this Cache Management, so you have to set the flavor parameter to Keystone only. And once you're done with this, the only thing you have to do is to restart your Glance services and it will just work. So then you can create your glance images and uh, upload whatever you want. So one note here, when it comes down to the glance images, uh, by default, uh, on the Nova Compute node, uh, most of the people do store their glance images using QCAL as a format, QCAL2. Um, but for RBD to be uh, you know, the most efficient, uh, we recommend that you store those boost images as raw format. Why? Because this way, you have a completely expanded boot image, and remember, we make a clone. So by creating those images in raw format, you actually speed up the boot process for your VMs. If you do not choose raw as a format, we'll have to, just like we, what we do for any other type of store, we'll have to download the boot image, convert it to raw, so that we can actually use it. So one of the prereqs is to upload uh, raw uh, images into Glance. Now for Cinder, so very similar. So we have to create a pool. Now why do we create a separate pool? Because typically the load that we have on Glance images is completely different from the load we have on Cinder volumes. So we always have a higher load and a higher, uh, a higher space used for Cinder than what we have for Glance. So create a separate pool and create a separate user for Cinder. Now, one of the advantages with Cinder with the later versions uh, is that we can, for a long time now, Cinder does support multi-storage backends. So you can actually create full Cinder 
multiple pools in your Ceph cluster, one pool that uses SATA drives, one pool that uses SSDs, and you will, in Cinder, create two backends, one for SATA drives, one for the pool that uses SATA drive, one for the pool that uses SSD drives, and this way you can actually, depending on the type of VM, you can select on what type of storage you want to create the volume for that particular VM. So you will copy the uh, keyring file, just like what we did for Glance, and you will copy the sev.com file, just like what we did for Glance. In the configuration file on the Cinder node, just the same, uh, two lines to add, square bracket, the name of the user square bracket, followed by keyring equal, and the path to where you copy the actual keyring file, so that the Cinder daemons can actually access the Ceph cluster. So when you will be creating a volume, basically Cinder will go directly into the Ceph cluster and create an RBD device directly in your Ceph cluster, and that will be the RBD that will be attached to the VMs. Now in Cinder.conf, we're going to have to create one or more uh, Cinder backends. So square bracket, the name of the backend that you want to create in Cinder, the driver name will be cinder.volume.drivers.rbd.rbddriver. The capital uh, does, uh, the uppercase does matter. rbdcevconf will be the pass to the cev.conf5, exactly what we did here. RBD pool, the name of the pool that we created. And we're going to have one special stuff here, which is the RBD secret EUID. So this RBD secret EUID will be used so that when libvert is trying to access the Ceph cluster, we need to find a way so that we can make the relation with the credentials that must be used by libvert to actually access the Ceph cluster. So this UUID here, uh, generated with a UUID gen command, uh, will actually be used by libvert, and we're going to see the instructions after on how to create a secret within libvert so that libvert can actually access the Ceph cluster uh, when the VM's running. An RBD user will be the username. So this is basically the integration between Cinder and Libvert, where all of the other parameters are actually uh, used directly by Cinder to actually create the block device in the Ceph cluster. How do we create the secret for Libvert? We make one file, one temp file. You can call it the name you want. Secret ephemeral uh, UUID, that will be the famous UUID that we reference right here, OK? And Two options here, uh, it really depends on how the, how the people handle their configuration. Uh, you can either use a single username and a single UUID to access your Ceph cluster, even if you have multiple uh, Cinder backends, or some people, because they want to be very strict, they actually create separate users in the Ceph cluster and separate pools, and they assign a particular user and a particular UUID to every single storage backend. So it's up to you to do whatever you want. You can do both. Now, on the libvert nodes, that's where you will create this actual file, right? So usage site will be Ceph, and you will specify the username followed by secret. Now, you will do a secret define using this particular file. So this creates the secret. The secret contains the name of the user, and the ID of the secret is the UUID that we have in the file. What is missing? Remember, we said that for Ceph, to be able to access the Ceph cluster, you need to pass a username. We already have it here. What is missing? The famous secret key that we were discussing earlier. How do we assign the secret key? You will get the key from that particular user that you created for Cinder, your Cinder backend, and you will do a secret set value, dash dash secret, the ID of the secret that you have created, and dash dash uh, base64, the secret has to be encoded in base64, and that will be the key, the secret key, for that particular user. So at the bottom of the slide, if you got the proper versions, uh, did they print something? Or did you get access to a PDF? Did they send you a PDF when you registered for the session? OK. So I'll make sure that you all get the PDF, just in case. So there is one command uh, that is actually very simple. Remember, we have a Ceph auth get or create command, followed by the username. You have one command, ceph auth get dash key, followed by the username. And these only extract the secret key. And that's the secret key that you want. So either you store it in a file and you do a cat to do it, 
or if you have the proper permissions, you can actually directly run the Ceph auth get key command inside the dollar parenthesis so that you can just like run that in a single command. Now, if you have multiple um, libvirt nodes, we, you should have, most of you, I just remember that you need to synchronize the libvirt secrets directory so that this secret that you define on one libvirt node is actually available on all your libvirt nodes. Now, remember we said that Nova can also use Ceph RBDs for ephemeral storage. So if you want to also use that, then in nova.conf, in the libvirt section, you will set libvirt images type equal RBD. Images RBD pool will be the name of the pool where you want to actually use and create your RBDs for ephemeral storage. The RBD safeconf, which is the path to the safe configuration file. Lib uh, disk cache modes network equal write back. Uh, remember, this is ephemeral storage, so the idea is that we want to try to speed up the level of performance that we're going to be able to do on ephemeral storage. So RBD uh, does support different caching mechanism, and one of them is known as the write-back caching mode, so that we actually use the RAM directly on the client so that we can perform the I.O. requests directly in cache, so we maintain a cache on every single Nova compute node basically on every Ceph client node, but in the case of Nova, that will be on the Nova compute node. RBD secret EUID, remember the UID so that we can access uh, the, the Ceph cluster. So just like what we said for the multi um, cinder storage backend, some people reuse the same user for uh, ephemeral storage for Nova. Other people just like do, re, uh, do create a separate user for no, uh, Nova ephemeral storage. So it's, it's up to you guys. And the user ID that will be contained in the secret that you will create for Livert. And you just need to restart the Nova services. And every time you will just like boot a VM, now the ephemeral storage will be directly on RBDs. So Nova will create directly the RBDs and does whatever it wants uh, on those RBDs that will be stored in ephemeral storage. Now, one thing that is going to be very important is that when you um, have your environment, a lot of people, um, most of the time, when you know, people call because they have a problem, they open a case, or when we run the trainings, a lot of people get you know, uh, scared. We're saying, OK, we have our Nova compute node, and we're going to have all of our VMs running on our Nova nodes. How can we actually find out, when we have a problem, what to do? And there's a, a feature that is available from Ceph, and this feature is known as the admin socket. So the admin socket is the ability you have to talk directly to a particular connection. So by default, when you are a client, you do not create an admin socket. Only the demons, the OSDs, the monitors, the MDSs, do support, do enable this feature by default. But this feature can actually be enabled on the Nova compute node so that every single time you instantiate a new VM on the Nova compute node, this connection for that particular VM will have this admin socket so that you can actually troubleshoot the connection when the VM, you know, the guy that just like is using the VM is telling you, oh, I don't understand, the VM today is very slow. So admin socket uh, equal, so square bracket, client up the username that will be uh, the, the username that you have configured for Cinder. And if you want to troubleshoot the connection for the ephemeral storage, that will be the name for the user for Nova. So you, if you use the same user, you only specify one section. If you use multiple users, you will have to create multiple sections. Admin socket equal var run Ceph. So you create a subdirectory guest, okay? And in there, you will do dollar cluster. That's the name of the cluster, and by default, the name of the cluster when you deploy is Ceph. So it's, if, you did a, a, if you do a default deployment, it'll always be Ceph. Dash dollar type, that will be client. Dot dollar ID, that will be the user ID, so basically the username that you have here, that will be inserted here. Dot dollar PID, the process ID for your VM. 
that $CCTID that will be the Ceph cluster context ID. Remember we said that when you open a connection to the Ceph cluster, you have to specify to with what pool you want to work. So if you actually have, for example, on a VM, two volumes that you assign to the VM, one that is on SATA drive in a, on a pool that uses SATA drives, and another device that is on a pool that uses SSD drives. This will be two different contexts, one to the SATA pool, one to the SSD pool. So this way you will be able to troubleshoot either maybe the connection to the SATA pool or maybe the connection to the SSD pool. So to be able to talk to that connection, Ceph dash dash admin dash daemon, the path to the file, followed by the command that you want to issue against the connection that you want to troubleshoot. If you don't know about the commands to run, help. And help will print you on the screen all of the commands available supported by this particular connection. One of the commands that is mostly used most of the time is perf dump, so that you will be able to dump the performance counters for these particular connections to the Ceph cluster. What is cool too is that you can also do a config show so that you can actually dump all of the parameters used when connecting to the Ceph cluster. Config set and config get so that you can actually inspect only one parameter, but most important, so that you can actually change the value of one parameter. Why is it important? It's important because of this. So remember in the session we said we enable the admin socket but we are also going to redirect and assign a particular log file to the particular VM. And using the config set command, when you are troubleshooting, you can actually modify dynamically the debug level of the library so that you can have extra traces and the traces will be stored in that particular log file so that you can either, if you're familiar enough with the type of information logged, you can do the troubleshooting yourself, or if it's more serious, when you call support, you can actually send them the file with the traces that you got directly from the production environment so that you do not have to listen to the famous sentence, can you please reproduce the problem? Uh, of course I cannot because it happened just like in the middle of the blue, so that's better to be able to do it live as it is happening now, how do you do that? Um, the parameters that are responsible for logging always start with debug underscore, okay? So you have debug underscore client, debug underscore ms, debug underscore osd, debug underscore mds. So all of these parameters are accessible directly with this command. The highest level of debug you can set for a debug parameter to activate the tracing in the log file is 20. So my recommendation, if you're having a problem, you see it happening, uh, just like do a config set, the name of the parameter, most of the time, the first thing you will troubleshoot will be the communication library, what we call in the Ceph environment, the lib messenger library. That's the, the library that is used by everything in Ceph, OSDs, monitors, MDSS clients, to actually encode the TCP packets that, they, that we exchange. So one of the first things that you should do when you do troubleshooting is do a config set space debug underscore ms space 20. And this will set the maximum level of debug for the messenger library so that you see all of the messages ex exchange from the Nova compute node where your VM is running and for that VM only with the monitors, with the OSDs and everything you are talking in the Ceph cluster. And at least with that, if you open a case or you're familiar, it will, uh, you'll be able to get the proper information. So we are running slow. Sorry? Okay. So you have the extra slides for the Redos Gateway integration. And uh, you have at the end of the slides, uh, sorry we're not able to cover them, everything when it comes to, uh, related to uh, Red Hat subscriptions, Red Hat consulting, Red Hat storage training, if you're looking for training on Ceph. Uh, and very important, you have access to a Red Hat storage test drive, so that if you want to play with Ceph, for those of you who have never played, 
you can actually create your own little self cluster directly using uh, what we call a test drives in AWS. Thank you so much. Hope you've enjoyed it and that you learn stuff.